in a world full of voices, all demanding our attention, all seemingly more demanding than the last, there's only one voice that will lead us home, the voice of the shepherd. But how do we hear him in all the noise? There are so many voices, so much noise, and so many storms. And yet, we hear his voice in us in John chapter 10. We see Jesus and what he says about listening to the voice of the shepherd. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is a shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will, they will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. And on down into chapter 10, we hear some other words. Down in verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who, does not, who is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them up and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep. And in verse 27 he says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Father, as we begin to dig into your word this morning, there's so many things going on in our world. The news comes on at night and tells us about it's a good evening and then proceeds to tell us about all the bad things that happened during the day. Father, there's so many storms going on around us. It's hard to concentrate when we see them. And we can get so caught up in them and we need to remember to listen to you, to your word, to what it teaches and to what you teach us and help us to listen to your voice. Guide and direct our steps, Lord, each day. Help us to be faithful sheep. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes we don't listen, do we? My wife has got a lot of comments about that. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, I'll introduce this in a little bit, but I'll tell you, this is my wife, Tammy, by the way. Um, but we don't listen. If my wife stands up and starts talking to me, I can tell you, I can guarantee you if the television's on, I haven't heard one word she said. Now, guys, this isn't helping us, but it's a thing we do. We block things out. Ladies, you do it too, but not as, not as well as we do. Let's put it that way. Sometimes we do it to our spouses. Sometimes we do it to our children. Sometimes we do it to the one who gave his life for us, Jesus, the shepherd. Sometimes we're not content to be... Sometimes, excuse me, sometimes we're just content to be in the presence of the shepherd. shepherd. And that's okay, sometimes. But sometimes we are so absorbed in what we're doing, what we're thinking with ourselves, that we don't listen. What about, or maybe better yet, who are you listening to? How do you listen to God? How do you prepare yourself to listen? A good one. What does God sound like? 
Sometimes he sounds like my wife. Sometimes he sounds like my kids. Sometimes he sounds like somebody on the radio. You put your own way that you hear in there. I've told this story many times at funerals. A doctor walks into the patient's room, and he's not, he doesn't have good news for him. He tells him he has cancer, and he doesn't have much time. The man says, I'm afraid to die. What's it like on the other side? Some of you may have heard this story, because I've told it a lot. The doctor says, I don't really know. His dog is on the other side of the door in the room. He says, do you hear that, my dog, on the other side? The man said, yes. The doctor says, he's never been in this room, but he knows that I am here. He hears my voice, and that's all that matters to him. He trusts me. He wants to be with me because he can hear my voice and knows that I am safe and secure and always love and care for him. I, in effect, happen to be his shepherd. My mantra, my goal, if you so you, so you might say, in life is that I want to be the person that my dog thinks I am. Those of you that don't have dogs, you don't understand that. My dog will be standing at the door when we get home. He has no idea what my day's been like, what's going on, anything that's going on around. He just knows that I'm coming home, and he can't wait to see me. That's the way we should be with people. Jesus compares us to sheep. If we go on into the 10th chapter of John and we read from the 6th verses on down through the 10th or 11th, Jesus is talking to them, and it's a parable, it's a figure of speech, but they do not understand what he has to say. So again, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I tell you, I am the gate of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to him. I am the gate. Whoever enters by, the, by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and destroy and kill. I came that they may have, it in, may have life and have it in abundance. I love the story of the shepherd and the sheep, mostly because I can relate to it so well. I grew up on a farm. I knew a lot about animals, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But that's why this passage is so important to me, because I know how animals listen. I know what they'll do. They don't follow anybody else. They follow their owner. This passage tells us that the voice of the shepherd goes before us. The voice of the shepherd guides us. The voice of the shepherd protects us. And the voice of the shepherd tells us who we are. Hearing that voice, the voice of the shepherd, must be pretty important. The voice of the shepherd goes before us. Before we start out each day, we need to pray and clearly and hear clearly for guidance and direction for the day. We have nothing good or bad happened in it yet. And we need to make sure that it happens that way and it stays that way if we can. So we start out in prayer, seeking God. Often we wait, though, until we don't have many options left but to pray. I don't know why that is. The older I get, the less frequent that is. But when I'm young, when I was younger, it seemed like we tried everything in the world to do something before we take time to pray about it. In Psalms 46.1, he says, the psalmist writes, God is our very present help in times of trouble. Often, when in trouble, we look for help any place we can find it. God assures us he is that help. The first thing that God does is find us. Psalms 9, chapter 9, verse 10. And those who know your name 
put their trust in you, O Lord, have not forsaken those, you have not forsaken those who seek you. In Psalm 34, 4, it says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. In Luke chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, this is out of the Amplified Version. I love it because sometimes you're looking for words and this just kind of explodes the words. So I say to you, ask, and keep on asking, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and keep on seeking, and you shall find. Knock, and keep on knocking, and the door shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks and keeps on asking receives. And he who seeks and keeps on seeking finds. And to him who knocks and keeps on knocking, the door shall be opened. The voice of the shepherd goes before us. A guy by the name of Hugh Redwood was a preacher in England. During one of the periods of his life, he had some very difficult decisions to make and wasn't sure what he should do. He asked God for guidance. But as sometimes happens, the heavens are silent. You ever have that happen to you? You're seeking and you're seeking and you're seeking, and it's silence. One evening, excuse me, he went to, some, to have dinner with some friends. When the meal was over, his hostess suggested he go to the study, put his feet up, and relax beside the fire. You was glad for the little bit of peace and quiet so that that's what he did. As promised, he found a fire burning. As he sat down in one of the chairs, he noticed the King James Bible sitting there. He picked it up and discovered it was, it was open to Psalms 59. He began to read, and as he came to the 10th verse, these words were underlined. The God of mercy shall prevent me. The word prevent in the King James version of the Bible means to go before. The God of mercy shall go before me. My God, in his loving kindness, shall meet me at every corner. In every little area of my life, he will be there. Those words were so powerful and became a lamp turning on for you. The God of my mercy shall go before me. My God in his loving kindness shall meet me in every corner. Psalms 119, 105 says, Thy lamp is, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Saturate yourself in God's word. Listen to his voice. How do you do that? Through scripture many times. There are others, but we have scripture for us to help us make our way through, the life, through this life. The voice of the shepherd guides us, but it's hard to obey and to trust when you can't see him, isn't it? Proverbs chapter 3 says these words in five and, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your pathways. When we are in trouble, don't question what he says. Hold on dear to dear life. Without his voice, we have nothing. As the tape said, listen to his voice. I love the part in the video When he says that one day we will hear that voice as he calls us home. And we'll realize he's the one that's been leading us. I love the part in the video. When he awakens to the sound of the knock on the door and he realizes just that. You're the voice. When we prepare our hearts through prayer and worship... We are able to more fully and more clearly listen to us. He is, we are able and more fully and clearly list, able to listen to him, to the voice of the shepherd. And when we listen, the voice of the shepherd guides us. 
And number three, the voice of the shepherd protects us. I say that because you have to make sure that the voice you are listening to is the right voice. How many times have you gotten a call on the phone and it's an insurance company or it's somebody that wants to sell you some uh, extra insurance on your van? My mom used to get that. My, her van was 15 years old. And they said, your warranty's about to run out. It's run out a long time ago. And you have to pay this. If you don't pay this right away, you're going to be out. You, your engine could blow up. It could have blew up a long time ago. It's not going to matter. The one I love is when you get the call, hello, this is a recorded message. Can you hear me? Do not answer that. Do not, people, answer that. They thrive on getting you to say answers and questions that they're asking. They're not going to record me for anything because I'm not going to let them click. You block them, and they call again on another number. And they keep calling. I can't tell you how many times the police are going to come get me because I owe back taxes that I don't owe a dime on. But we're swearing out a warrant for you right now. I don't care. Swear it out. I haven't done anything wrong. <laughs> I love this story. Verse 10 of of chapter 10 says, the, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. In an ice cream parlor in Bethesda, Maryland, it was robbed one day. But the manager, Nathan Peabody, was warned in time. Moments before the robbery, he was contacted by phone. The voice said, are you the manager? Listen carefully. Do not panic. This is the police. You are going to be robbed. Do not resist. Let the robber have your money. We will be waiting right outside your store. We need to catch him with the money on him. Thank you for your cooperation. Sure enough, a man came in with a knife and robbed him. And Mr. Peabody took out all the cash out of the drawer and gave it to him. And Peabody watched as the robber left out of the store and waiting for the cops to close in. Instead... The robber got in his own car and drove away. And as he saw the taillights disappear in the distance, he realized that he had what had happened. He realized that the call hadn't come from the police headquarters after all, but from the thief. The thief comes to steal only and to kill and destroy. He came, Jesus came, God came to us that we might have life and have it in abundance. Listening to the voice of the shepherd helps us making hard decisions. The name Christian is our birthright. From the moment of our baptism and our birth into the kingdom of God, the good shepherd promises to lead us to green pastures beside the still waters. He promised to restore our soul and leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. The voice of the shepherd protects us. In verse 26 through 30 of John chapter 10, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They know me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of my Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Don't watch the storm. I love that when he was in that plane. He's in the clouds, and if you've ever been, picture yourself in this. Maybe you've been in this. Maybe you can understand this. You are in a dense fog going down the road. I drove truck for a lot of years for General Motors, and I drove up and down 23, and I can tell you right now, south of Ann Arbor and south of 94 is the darkest, foggiest area, the densest, foggiest area there is in any place in the state of Michigan. And you're going along, and you can't see anything. It's a proven fact. If you've never done this, be careful you're doing it, but try it. Watch what I'm saying. It's a proven fact. You don't run with your cruise control on. But when you do it with a gas pedal, you drive faster than if you wasn't driving with your cruise control on. 
because you're not aware of what's going on. You're in a nothingness. You can't see anything. When you can't see the taillights of anything ahead of you, it's time to slow down. Actually, in my opinion, it's time to get off the road, but it's time to slow down and watch. Don't watch the storm. Believe me, trust the voice. If you watch the storm, he says, you will die. It's an eternal death and a separation, a complete, everybody knows they're going to die, but he's talking about a complete separation from God. Millions have crashed and burned because they refuse to listen to my voice. And millions more are doing the same today. And last, the voice of the shepherd tells us who we are. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A lot of people have taken a lot of comfort in the 23rd Psalm. The voice of the shepherd goes before us. Sheep are very fearful creatures. I have a friend of mine. He's deceased now, but he raised sheep in North Branch. And he said sheep are some of the dumbest animals you ever met in your life. Because they won't do anything. If the water gets rippled, they won't touch it. They won't, they're afraid to do anything. So you can understand why God talks about us in that way. Because he helps us to understand who we are. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Are you listening? The voice of the shepherd goes before us. The voice of the shepherd guides us. The voice of the shepherd protects us. And the voice of the shepherd tells us who we are. I told you I grew up on a farm. My wife and I, I'm 72 years old. I've lived in North Branch my whole life. Not West Branch, North Branch, north of Lapeer. I've lived there my whole life. I grew up on a farm. I used to have a great time with our cousins and stuff when they come up to the farm. I could walk out on our porch, on the, out in the back porch, getting ready to go to the barn, and just call the cattle, and they'd line up, and away they'd come. My cousins would come out there, and they'd holler and wave their hands and do all kinds of things. All I did is whistle or just holler at them, and off they come. They wouldn't do anything for my cousins. I can tell you a lot of story about cousins. I used to love the boys and electric fences. There's nothing like it. <laughs> you can get them a charge that they'll never forget. And if any of you have ever had that happen to you, you understand what I'm saying. And if you haven't, don't fall for the farmer trick to get you to touch that fence. <laughs> we can hear our wife's voice. Tammy and I could be, Tammy could be sitting out in that lobby out there and, and thousands of people talking out there. I can hear her voice. But he can't when he's sitting right there next to Tammy. <laughs> this isn't about you. <laughs> this, this is very, very rude. <laughs> I'm kidding. She can be out there. And, and you ladies can understand it maybe better than guys can. There can be a room of a thousand babies. How do you know it's your baby that's crying? Any mom that's ever had children knows her kids' sounds. Tammy and I have only been married for 12 years. My first wife and I were married for 30, almost 39 years. She died and... and um, we were, during all that time, if, if I heard her voice today, if I couldn't see her and I heard her voice, I would know it instantly. My grandfather was my best friend. 
when I grew up. I grew up on a farm, as I said, and, and before we bought, moved on to our farm, we were at theirs and doing chores and stuff, and, and every place he went, I went with him. If I didn't go, it was because of my choice. It wasn't his. It was always, he knew that I was going with him wherever we went. My grandfather's been gone for almost 60 years. And I can tell you right now, I can hear his voice just like yesterday. Grandparents, parents, kids, we can hear the things that matter to us the most. No matter what's going on around us, Focus on him and concentrate on his voice. Quit focusing on the storm. Yes, but how do we hear him? Scripture is the most important way to hear God today. Does he speak to people? Absolutely. Absolutely. I hear God all the time. When you read Scripture, does it come out at you sometimes? That's God. He's wanting to get your attention. Does it jump off the page? Have you read that same scripture a hundred times and never understood it? Until today, something's going on in your life that God needs you to see that. The older we get, the more that happens, it seems like. When you're young, you're busy, you're, you're involved in all kinds of things. But when you get older, you start to settle down and you start to realize the things that are important. Nine o'clock when I was a kid was a curfew. Now it's a blessing! I can't wait for night. We're looking at the clock and it's only 8.30. It's only 8.30. We can't go to bed yet. Think about that. You don't ever do that? Am I the only one that does that? <laughs> you, you, you just, you allow those kinds of things to control your life. And, and the things that we think were so troublesome and so bad are wonderful. There is nothing like a nap. Nothing like it. I drove truck for a lot of years. I drove for almost 40 years for General Motors. And when I drove truck and I'd pull in someplace, the first thing I'd do when I backed into the dock is I'd doze off. Take a 10-minute quick nap. When I was on the farm, when I was cultivating, my grandfather could cultivate the slowest of anybody in my, I've ever seen in my life. You could almost... I know I could walk a lot faster than that tractor was going, but you almost had to draw a line to see the tires move. And he's cultivating. We had we were growing sugar beets, and, and for those of you that don't know what that is, it's, it's a beet that takes... At that time, there was a lot of things we did with it. They don't do it today. We didn't have the GPSs and all that kind of stuff they have today. But we'd be on that tractor, and we'd, I'd be cultivating. I wouldn't cultivate the, the, the beets because... It, it, pretty soon I'd be over here or over there and I'd taken out a whole row or two of them because I'd fall asleep. But when I was cultivating and I got to the other end of the row, there was nothing like getting off the tractor, putting your head up against the wheel on that tractor and the home of that tractor and going to sleep for 10 minutes. And when you woke up, you felt like a million dollars. When we hear the voice of God, when he speaks to us, when it comes out to us, you feel like a million dollars. You are so refreshed and so invigorated because you know he hears you. And you know, you know he has what's best for your interests. How many times did you hear when you were growing up, I'm doing this for your own good. I'm doing this for your own good. When you're whipping me, it ain't for my own good. I used to sit there and think to my dad when he did that, I'm thinking... He said, this hurts me more than it hurts you. No, it don't. But as you grow up, you understand that. How many of you enjoy hurting your kids? Nobody. You don't do that because you do it because you, everything you do for them is out of love. Because you are concerned about them. Everything that God says to us and does to us is out of love. Listen to his voice. Quit looking at the storm. The, the Supreme Court, the government of the United States, is not going to take you home. I don't care what you're hearing and what you're seeing. This is not it. The end of the book says we win. I don't care what it looks like at halftime. Halftime doesn't matter. Halftime is just that. Halftime. There's a whole other period or two or whatever to play. It's not done. It's not over. 
You're not home yet. And until you are, you have things to do. No matter what's going on around you, quit focusing on the storm. I like the passage out of 1 Kings chapter 19. You're all familiar with Elijah. I hope. And, and Elijah had just got done killing all the prophets of Baal. And, and, and it was a, it's a big story, and I won't go into the whole story. But he's running cause, because Jezebel has threatened to kill him. Now, he's just watched God do a whole bunch of neat things. He's come down and he's soaked. Uh, there's been water poured around. There's burnt offerings there. He doesn't have a match. He doesn't have nothing. God comes down and licks all it up, burns up the offering, and it's all gone. And the prophets of Baal are killed. He's watched all that. He's witnessed that. But Ahab, Jezebel, says she's going to kill him like he has her prophets. And Elijah says, God tells him to go and, and get away because He's going to sit there. He's going to come and talk to him. And in the 11th verse of that 19th chapter, he says, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it split mountains and broke rocks into pieces before God. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, sheer sound of silence. Elijah heard that and walked out to the mouth of the cave, wrapped his face in his mantle, and stood at the entrance. Then there came the voice. I have a friend of mine in she makes this comment quite often when I've, when I've read this. God needs to scream and yell at me to get my attention. No, he don't. No, he don't. He comes many times. Yeah, and a whole bunch of noise may be going on around you. But what you're hearing is deathly silence. And you know the peace that passes all understanding that Scripture talks about. In John chapter, in 1 John chapter 5, we have this assurance. These things we are written in Scripture that we may know. It's not that we're left orphaned, orphans as orphans and don't know. That's why you celebrate communion. That's why you do all these things because we're doing this as remembrance. I love communion. I love to sit down and think about what was going on in the minds of those disciples that night. Sometime if I ever get a chance to come down here, I'll talk to you about it. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Get to your quiet place. Wait and listen. You will begin to recognize His voice as you do a parent or a sibling or a spouse or something else. When you do, Make sure what you hear lines up with Scripture. God doesn't change. We do. Make sure that it's within the perimeters of Scripture. Don't be like the guy at the ice cream shop. It all starts by surrendering. Scripture says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Where does it start from there? I, I, Sometimes as Christians, we get focused on other things and we get drawn aside. I love the 51st Psalm because that's David's after he sinned with Bathsheba. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by and through me. John chapter 14, verse 6. If you want me to get you home, you have to promise me you will obey my voice. God may be saying that to somebody sitting here this morning. I don't know. 
Listen to that still small voice and quit looking at the storm. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us how to listen, teaching us, Lord, of your compassion for us, teaching us that your love has no boundaries. Teaching us, Lord, that in you there is no condemnation for those of us who are in you. The world doesn't know that. There are thousands, millions, and hundreds of thousands that are out here that don't listen to the voice, ignore the voice. We are your kids. We need to hear you, Father. Speak to us your words of life so that we may share them with the world outside. All the noise that's going on, Father, all of the friends that we have, many of us have friends that are, are not Christian that need to hear you. Help us, Father, to look and seek and search for them and to share your light with them, your word. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask it. Amen.